So um, everyone, uh, just a few housekeeping tips to start off. Everyone is muted upon entry to reduce the amount of background noise. But if you do have a question or a comment or concern, please feel free to use the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can send a chat directly to me or to any of the speakers, um, or you can send it just to everyone. Um, if you would rather ask your question in person, um, just uh, raise your hand with the little hand icon at the bottom, and I will unmute you, and you can ask your question that way. Um, so let me give a little overview of what's going to be covered today. Our third webinar is focused, like I said, on food waste diversion, with speakers discussing anaerobic digestion, large-scale composting, and backyard composting, and the benefits that each strategy has and that might be best for your home, business, and community. Like I said, we're joined by the Compost Ferry and University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, and from also a fellow colleague in TDEC. Our presenters have a wealth of knowledge and experience that will help us better understand the challenges and solutions to food waste source, uh, and source reduction as far as diversion. So with all of that being said, I'm going to start off and just give you all a quick background of uh, Get Food Smart and about our upcoming final webinar on Thursday, March 11th, um, next month. And it will be, be titled Beyond the Hierarchy. We will be discussing policy strategies as well as technologies that, that are uh, solutions that are being worked on to help combat food waste. So, um, Get Food Smart TM was formally launched in April 2018. We have three components there is education and outreach recognition and technical assistance. Outside of these functions, staff works in the food waste space in the capacity of uh, legislation, partnerships, and granting programs. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our first speaker, and that's going to be Robert Wadley. Robert has worked for the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation's Division of Solid Waste Management since March 2006. As a department subject matter expert for organics management, he is tasked with increasing the diversion of organics from landfills through source reduction, feeding people, feeding animals, industrial uses, and composting. He has a BS in biology from Union University in Jackson, Tennessee, and is a SWANA certified professional in composting programs. And if you've ever met him, he is just awesome person um, to be around and to work with and um, has such a wealth of knowledge on composting. So without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Robert. Well, thank you, Ashley. Okay, so let's talk about backyard composting. What is backyard composting? Well, composting is a word with a long history. Defining composting can be challenging as it can mean many things to different audiences. Here are some definitions loosely based on Tennessee solid waste regulations. Composting is the accelerated biological decomposition of organic or carbon-based solid waste under managed aerobic conditions, resulting in a stabilized product that be used as a soil additive, fertilizer, growth media, or other beneficial use. Backyard composting is composting performed by a resident at the site of generation. Composting is essentially an accelerated version of nature's decomposition cycle. A tree grows in the soil, one of its leaves falls to the ground, insects and other animals eat the leaf. Some of the nutrients leach into the soil, but most of the material has been broken down by decomposers such as fungi and bacteria. This is further broken down by earthworms, bacteria, soil mites, fungi, etc., before it becomes organic rich soil, which will grow more plants. Let's talk about the history of composting. It has a long and interesting history largely as a means of increasing agriculture fertility. 
manure mixed with street sweepings was used as a soil conditioner in Mesopotamia. The process was known and practiced by the Romans and the Greeks, again, largely as a way of improving agriculture. The Bible and the Talmud both contain numerous references to the use of rotted manure, straw, and other organic. References to compost are contained in 10th and 12th century Arab writings. In medieval Europe, the church was the depository of agricultural knowledge. Abbots served as agriculture extension agents, spreading what we would now call best management practices. It's often said that composting in the U.S. started at Plymouth Rock by the pilgrims. However, the Native Americans had been placing dead fish into the soil when they planted corn for many years before that to add nutrients and organic matter. Around the same time in Europe, William Shakespeare's Hamlet advised, do not spread the compost on the weeds to make them ranker. Many of our founding fathers were farmers and all used compost. A colleague of mine took this picture of the dung depository at George Washington's Mount Vernon home. By the 19th century, composting was ingrained in American agriculture. Popular feedstock included the river muck, fish, manures, and cottonseed. The agronomist George Washington Carver once said, a compost pile is essential and can be had with little labor and practically no cash outlet. However, agricultural composting lost acceptance due to the rise of petrochemical fertilizer. A shift from small to large scale agriculture, increased mechanization, etc. Despite this, the 20th century contributed greatly to the science of compost. In the 1920s, the first proprietary composting system was developed in India by Sir Albert Howard. By the 1930s, Europe had its first full-scale composter, which took unground refuse and piled it into windrows. Intensive research was conducted in the 1950s and 60s at Michigan State, the UC Berkeley, and also through the U.S. Public Health Service. The focus at that time was on waste treatment more than making a product. Today, the science of composting is well understood but continues to evolve. New applications, new technology, and new feedstock all present new challenges. Please remember to mute yourself. <laughs> the current trend is merging. Waste treatment is agricultural industry. Urban materials are composted for essential applications in farm, other waste production and environmental protection continues to be a major driver for composting activity. J. I. Rodell is often credited for reintroducing American gardeners to the value of composting for improving soil quality. He established a farming research center in Pennsylvania and the monthly organic gardening magazine in the last half of the 20th century. Now organic methods in gardening and farming are, increased, are increasingly popular. A growing number of farmers and gardeners who relied on chemical fertilizers are now realizing the value of compost for plant growth and restoring depleted soil. So why compost in your backyard? By managing the material on the side of generation, less energy is being used in the management of organic materials. Compost can be used to improve topsoil by increasing organic matter content. Food scraps and yard trimmings make up about 29% of what we throw away by weight. That's not even including our 15% paper and paperboard, some of which isn't easily recycled, but can be composted, like pizza boxes. These items produce landfill gas, which is about 50% methane when landfill versus carbon dioxide when composted. Methane is a greenhouse gas 23 times more powerful than carbon dioxide, and over a 20 year period can be 72 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So what can we do with finished compost? So you can incorporate it into the soil, generally spread it about two or four inches deep and, and till it under. 
Topsoil should contain at least 5% organic matter. You can make potting soil with it. In square foot gardening, like the picture here, the soil is made of compost, peat moss, and vermiculite. You can top dress your lawn with it. Plug aerating prior is preferred, but not required. You can mulch around plants with it, two to three inches deep out to the drip line, but not touching the stalk or trunk. You can use it for erosion control, like in bioretention areas, in erosion stalks, and in rain gardens. You can also use it in bioremediation which is using the compost to bind heavy metals found in contaminated soil. So what are the benefits of using compost? While compost isn't typically considered a fertilizer, it contains a full spectrum of the essential plant nutrients. You can test your compost and soil to find out what other supplements it may need for specific plants. Compost helps bind clusters of soil particles called aggregates, which provide good soil structure. Such soil is full of tiny air channels and pores that hold air, moisture, and nutrients. In fact, compost can hold up to three times its weight in moisture and can reduce the need for watering. Compost brings and feeds diverse life into the soil. These bacteria, fungi, insects, worms, and more support a healthy plant growth. The earthworms it attracts is especially important in aerated the soil. Healthy soil is an important factor in protecting our waters. Compost increases soil's ability to retain water and decrease runoff. Runoff pollutes water by carrying soil, fertilizers, and pesticides to nearby streams. The phrase compost happens is true. Organic materials decay. This is a natural phenomenon that happens with or without people. Nature disperses nutrient-rich materials abundantly. However, humans tend to concentrate them on scales far greater than nature ever would, requiring a thoughtful and managed approach to rot. This is how composting came to be. Through rigorous science, the process of trial and error, various approaches and technologies have been developed to best manage the compost process. Here's a flow chart of the compost process. In the center, we have the compost pile, which is a mixture of nitrogen-rich and carbon-rich materials, often called greens and browns. Microorganisms are responsible for most of the work in the composting process. Because composting microorganisms are ubiquitous, we don't have to add them to the process. However, adding a, pro a shovel full of soil or compost can help speed the process along. Because composting microorganisms are living beings, we must provide a hospitable environment for them. Composting is a largely an aerobic process. In other words, most of the microorganisms that evolved in the compost process breathe oxygen. They also require moisture and have temperature preferences. As the microorganisms work and reproduce, they produce a product we call compost and release carbon dioxide, water, and heat. There are lots of organisms involved in the composting process, but we're primarily concerned with bacteria, fungus-like bacteria, and fungi. This slide shows the three phases of compost. The first phase is mesophilic which is 68 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And it generally only lasts a few days. Mesophilic or medium temperature loving bacteria break down soluble, readily degradable compounds such as sugars and starches. The second phase is thermophilic, which is 105 degrees to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. This stage lasts several weeks to several months. Thermophilic or high temperature loving bacteria break down proteins and fats, and they work with fungus-like bacteria to begin breaking down cellulose and more resistant forms of part. The third stage is also mesophilic with temperatures below 105 degrees Fahrenheit and it's called the curing or maturation stage. It takes one to several months. Fungus-like bacteria and fungi are important during the curing stage 
in attacking the most resistant compounds like lignin. So how do you compost? Well, first you want to select the location. Then you may or may not construct a bin and add organic material in the proper amount. Stir and add water as necessary. Then wait until most of the bacterial activity diminishes. Then you may or may not cure and screen your compost, but it's ideal. Here are some considerations when selecting a location for your compost pile or bin. Your location should be well drained because it will allow you to control the moisture content better. A shady spot is preferable to the sun only to prevent your pile or bin from drying out. Composting works fine in full sun, you just may have to add water more often. While on the subject of water, you want the site close to a water hose or rain barrel so that you can add water as necessary. You are more likely to compost if it's convenient. So site your pile or bin close to your house, but possibly away or at least downwind from your neighbors. Having it close to the garden will make it so that you don't have to carry the clippings very far, as well as having the finished product close to a pretended use. Like I said, constructing a bin is optional. Bacteria become dormant when the temperature drops below 55 degrees Fahrenheit. If properly built, the composter pile interior will be well above that temperature, even in freezing weather. However, decomposition slows in the winter time, especially when we're talking about backyard composting. To achieve optimal hot composting temperatures are of 140 degrees Fahrenheit at any season, a minimum pile size is required. This is often called critical mass. Otherwise, the heat generated by the initial organism quickly dissipates before the pile can reach the right temperature for the thermophilic bacteria. A pile must be at least three foot in each dimension to provide the necessary critical mass. For best heating, try to heat Try for a heap four to five feet square on the bottom, rising to four feet high. Buying or constructing a bin is optional, but it has its benefits. For one, containerizing can help you get the necessary critical mass with less material and less area. Also, bins can be constructed in a way that exclude vermin. Additionally, bins give you something to push against when turning the pile. Construct your bin in such a way that it makes turning the pile easily, such as having an open or removable end. Pallets, cinder block, and wire mesh can make excellent composting bins. Of course, you can also purchase a bin. Just be sure that it fits your needs. Regardless of where you go with a pile or a bin, be sure there's enough airflow for composting organisms to breathe. Here are some examples of what you should and shouldn't be composted in a backyard system. You can compost fruit and vegetable scraps, grass clippings, reds and grains, coffee grounds, hair and fur, leaves, twigs, shredded newspaper, cardboard rolls, clean paper, and fireplace ashes in small amounts. Do not add dairy, meat, fats, bones, oil, most pet waste, Seafood scraps, plastic stickers from fruits or vegetables, metal, glass, treated or painted wood. Compost feedstocks are often categorized by the amount of carbon and nitrogen contained. Greens are high in nitrogen, browns are high in carbon. Don't get too concerned with the color of the feedstock though. There are exceptions. Livestock manure, coffee grounds, and bread are green. Paper can be pretty much any color, but it's considered a brown. Fireplace ashes should only be added in small amounts, if at all, because they can be too alkaline. Anything that was once living or naturally produced by a living organism will compost. However, not everything is advisable compost in backyard system due to vermin, pathogen, and odors. Some pet or livestock waste is safer than others, but will all likely have some risk of pathogen. While we're on the topic of pathogen, this would be a good time to mention that we should practice good hygiene when working with compost. 
it's always a great idea to wash your hands before putting them near your mouth, but it's especially a good idea after working in your compost pile. Also, you may want to use disposable gloves if you have cuts or sores on your hands. Since some of the main decomposers in compost are mold and other fungi, you may want to wear respiratory protection, especially if you have a compromised immune system when turning the pile. Next, you need to add organic mat material in the proper amounts. You want at least as much brown material as green material, possibly three or four times as much by volume. You can add material to your pile continuously or all in one batch. Regardless, you want the mix to be fluffy so that the composting organisms can breathe. Particle size can play a big role. Generally, you want a mix of large and small particles to provide proper airflow. The method on the left is an example of a continuous composting system. This is sometimes called the layer to lasagna method, where you alternate thick layers of brown material with thin layers of green material. The top and bottom layers should be brown. The method on the right is a batch method where you add the green and brown material all at once, then you don't add any more to the pile. The batch method is faster, but not always convenient for homeowners. There are other systems, such as the wandering compost pile or a three bin, but they all can be categorized as either continuous or batch. Stir and add water as necessary. The more you turn the material, generally the faster the process goes. In a batch system, turn about every three days. In a continuous system, turn the freshest part of the pile after you add new material, or don't. A garden fork is a good tool to turn compost, but sometimes a specialty tool may be better. You want the compost to be as wet as a wrung out sponge, so you may need to add water. Wait until most bacterial activity has diminished. Notice the seam. The bacteria are still hard at work in this picture. Depending on your operation, this stage can last a few weeks to several months. So how do you know if most of the bacterial activity has diminished? The temperature in the pile drops to near the temperature of the surrounding air. It smells earthy, not sour, putrid, or like ammonia. It no longer heats up after being turned or watered. It looks like dark soil. And it's crumbly and doesn't have identifiable food items, leaves, or grass. While optional, curing your compost lets the fungi break down the byproducts of the bacteria and makes it safer on the plant. This can take several months because the fungi work slowly. You can let the compost age in the field if applied in the fall, but you may want to screen it first. Screening is optional, but often desired. For once, it removes the inorganic fraction, like produce stickers and other plastic that won't break down. It also removes the large chunk called overs that need to be reprocessed. If you reuse the over, it inoculates the pile with the desired microorganism. Every compost pile, from the small pile in your backyard to the largest multi-million dollar facility, is controlled by the same parameters. Initial feedstock mix, pile moisture, pile aeration, pile shape and size, pile temperature, and compost retention time. Your initial mix should be be between three and four times as much brown material as green material. Your pile should be as damp as a wrung out sponge. Your pile should be light and flat. If you use a bin, it should allow good airflow. Your pile should be three feet in all directions. The shape of the pile will determine how much volume it will be. A cylinder is more efficient than a cube or a cone. For hot composting, you will want to achieve about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. 
the power temperature will determine how long the active compost process takes. It can take a few weeks to several months. However, it's somewhat difficult to speed up the curing and maturation stage. Troubleshooting your composting pile. If the materials aren't decomposing, your piles could be too dry, anaerobic, or may have too much carbon. You may have to add water, turn the pile, or add bulking materials to add oxygen, or add more green material. If there's ammonia odor, you likely have too much nitrogen. You need to add some browns, such as leaves and straw. If there's a rotten odor, you likely have anaerobic conditions, or you just may not have the pile mixed very well. You will need to either turn the pile or add some coarse dry materials. If you're getting vermin, you may need to bury the food scraps better. I will now take questions and, oops, I thought I had my, I thought I had my contact info on this slide. Anyway, um, if you need to contact me, my phone number is 615-741-4907. My email address is robert.widely at tn.gov. Thanks, Robert. And there is one question. If critical mass of 3x3x3 three by three by three foot pile is needed to attain proper temperature, how do the small home composters get to critical mass temperature? They don't. Um, they don't. They rely on longer times and um, a cold composting method. So they don't generally reach um, that temperature. They'll get, um, they'll have a small, section that may get to that temperature, um, but for the most part, it, it doesn't get quite that warm. Um, and if it does, it's a very small area, uh, so you'll, you'll need to turn. But regardless, it takes longer uh, in a small pile than it w does uh, in a large pile. So you're likely to have more successful backyard composting at home if, if you have a larger pile. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Um, okay. I mean, you might get to that temperature, but for the most part, you're not going to get to that temperature unless um, unless you have a larger pile. Um, so you're relying on time and a uh, and in lo um, lower temperatures because it, it pasture reduction will happen um, at lower temperatures. It just takes longer. So um, while at a commercial facility, you may, the active composting process may be more like 15 days or something at a home composting, you're, you're looking at, you know, three months or more, so. Great. Well, thanks, Robert. Um, I don't see any more questions, but if anyone thinks of any that, uh, that you wanted to ask throughout the rest of the webinar, please feel free to uh, send it in the chat to either me or Robert. Um, and thank you so much, Robert, for that. I always learn something new when, when I hear you speak. So thank you so much. All righty, next up, we have Mike Lorevi. He is a licensed professional geologist and general manager for Atlas Organics Compost and Hauling Operations. He received a Master of Science degree from the Earth Science Department at the University of Memphis and continued his academic training as a William J. Fulbright Scholarship Award winner in Latvia. In 2019, Mike became the Vice President of the Tennessee Chapter of the U.S. Composting Council. He is the founder and executive director of Compost Ferry, a nonprofit waste diversion and soil rehabilitation effort founded in Memphis in 2017. Compost Ferry won the Excellence in Green Business Award from the Tennessee Urban Forestry Council for 2018 and the Governor's Environmental Stewardship Award in 2019. So 
without further ado, I'm going to give you presenter capabilities. Mike, give me just a minute. And you should be good to go. Awesome. Love to go in there, team. <laughs> All good. Good, good. All right. Um, where is my little clicky? I'm looking. To the right of where you see 28 at the top. Oh, I don't see a 28 at the top. <laughs> I see, I see attendees 28, sort of midway. So it's a, if above the at the top of Robert's last slide, where it says questions, that toolbar is this 28. Oh, yeah, look, you <laughs> there, there we go. All right. Hooray, hooray, hooray. Sorry about that. Uh, scientist and not a tech guy for a reason. Um, thanks for having me here today. Um, I feel like three quarters of my presentation, I could just say what my buddy and fellow U.S. Compost Council board member Robert said, um, for sure. Um, and uh, you're right, uh, it's really difficult to get to that, that thermophilic stage in the backyard, Robert. Uh, you can steal leaves from your neighbors uh, that aren't smart enough to not export their uh, the land the fertility of their land, uh, which is definitely something I've done in the past. Uh, but other than that, it is difficult. Uh, or you can work with your local compost operation on the commercial scale or industrial scale if it's available. Um, I founded the Compost Ferry in Memphis uh, in 2017, and we grew very, very, very quickly uh, and have recently merged with our buddies Atlas Organics, uh, who are based out of Spartanburg, South Carolina. And I now run a 6,000 ton per year uh, industrial facility in Memphis that is aiming to get an awful lot bigger uh, in the near future. So very exciting win um, for West Tennessee. I'm grateful uh, for the support uh, and encouragement of our friends at TDEC and other uh, government agencies uh, through the past few years. Uh, so without further ado, we'll talk a little bit about the benefits of uh, integrating residential and commercial organics management in municipal solid waste strategies, because we've got a big problem, as Robert said, on our hands, and we're not doing very much about it right now. So first thing uh, in solving problems is understanding that. Robert talked a little bit about the how of composting. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the why. And there are lots of, you know, biogas, waste to energy, sort of uh, fancy tech solutions that are failing miserably uh, in most cases uh, that are super expensive and result in us still burning carbon uh, to create the energy needs for our economy. We've got to do a little bit better than that. So up here in the little corner in lowercase letters uh, and not nearly as uh, accentuated uh, as it should be in this integrated management strategy, strategy model is composting. Composting is super important and it solves uh, a lot of problems all at once. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a minute. Uh, again, quantifying the problem is the first step to solving it. Uh, and these are these are uh, uh, five-year-old statistics for the most part. The new statistics indicate that that number, like our population, uh, is continuing to grow. Uh, but the U.S. throws away almost 40 million tons of food waste every year, uh, and that's over 200 pounds per person per year of food wasted, which is an awful lot. Uh, it's the single largest constituent of our municipal solid waste stream by volume and, account and accounts for 20% of our material uh, going to landfills right now or, or going to waste uh, by weight. 94% of all food waste is landfill. Uh, I am happy to report that that number is shrinking uh, as more and more large scale uh, commercial and industrial compost operations come online uh, throughout the country, um, which is good news for all of us. Uh, and five years ago, uh, only 1.57 million tons were diverted and composted. Uh, that number is about double um, based on what I'm seeing for 2020 statistics uh, right now. 
Organics are, are also our yard waste. Uh, we, we bag up our leaves, we throw our limbs and logs and branches and all of that sort of fun stuff, grass clippings uh, on the side of the road uh, and wait for the big giant diesel powered truck to come by and scoop it up and take it and throw it in a big hole in the ground in most cases. Not a great strategy. Uh, it, I like to call that house cat technology where little kitties go in the backyard. Uh, and bury their waste and problems. Uh, we put men on the moon. I feel like we can do a little bit better than that. Uh, that's 33.4 million tons. And again, this, these are 2015 numbers. Uh, uh, and it's 13.4% of our municipal solid waste stream by weight. Uh, that's 176 pounds per person per year. And if you're keeping track at home, you're sneaking up on 400 pounds of organics that each man, woman, and child in this country is sending to landfills. Uh, that's a, but the good news is there's a much higher diversion rate. There's lots of uh, mulching operations and other um, upstream uh, uses uh, of this material. Uh, so the capture rate is greater and a little bit more than half of that uh, nationally. Uh, is captured. Uh, this is this is a big uh, why slide right here. There are two things that that happen when uh, when food waste is sent to away. Uh, away is what we uh, have come to call the landfill. Essentially, away is a myth, uh, and we are heavily subscribed to it. We don't think an awful lot about where things are coming from or where they go once they leave uh, our immediate sphere. And that's really dangerous industrial thinking. Uh, man invented the conveyor belt. Uh, nature works in circles. And for uh, us to be successful in the long term, all of our systems, economic or otherwise, need to align with the natural systems in some way. Uh, waste management is definitely out of alignment and needs our help. Uh, so two things here, we're talking about uh, global warming, greenhouse gases, and climate change, right? So you take a head of lettuce uh, it, that has gone past its prime, and you put it in the compost bucket and send it to the compost ferry or Atlas Organics or, uh, you know, the compost company in Nashville, compost, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, compost Nashville could come and pick that up for you. There are several operations happening in the great state of Tennessee right now. Uh, and you give it to us where we manage, uh, we manage that material under aerobic conditions, as Robert said earlier. Uh, and that head of lettuce will be largely gone in a few, uh, few weeks and well on its way to becoming a super biologically uh, productive and uh, uh, useful soil amendment. Um, that same head of lettuce headed to the landfill and compacted by heavy machinery uh, and covered uh, over with tons and tons of other waste uh, is likely to last up to 25 years in that anaerobic environment. And the entire time it's in there, it's producing methane. Methane is a big problem. Uh, it's one of our biggest contributors uh, to climate change currently. Uh, and we'll talk uh, a little bit more about that here in just a minute. Leachate, uh, protect our aquifer is a big deal in Memphis right now, and leachate threatens uh, public health and the quality of our groundwater resources significantly if uh, permitted landfills are not handling that material uh, responsibly. So leachate, technically by Mr. Webster's de definition, is anything that comes, any liquid that comes out of a solution. Uh, in, in this case, it has a more nefarious meaning in landfills. Leachate is very toxic and expensive to, uh, to handle. Uh, and the, the confluence of many different waste streams at the landfill uh, have an amplification effect on the toxicity of that waste, especially if it's a permitted landfill that, that accepts hazardous waste. Uh, so hopefully, uh, our partners in the waste management industry are doing their jobs and managing that uh, that liquid responsibly so that it does not impact our groundwater. There's the big number. So this is according, Robert, and I know it's, it's slightly out of uh, alignment with your data, 
But this is from a 2019 study from the UK. Methane is 84 times more potent as the carbon that comes out of the tailpipe of the cars that we drive around in, in our great nation uh, in the short term. And by short term, that's 30 years. Uh, in 100 years, it's still 32 times more potent as a greenhouse gas uh, than carbon dioxide. And it's combustible, which means it blows up if it's not vented properly in landfill operations. Uh, here is a drone overhead of the white waste at South Shelby Landfill here in Memphis on Malone Road in West Tennessee. Uh, in 2015, uh, Shelby County Landfills received a little bit over 1.5 million tons of waste last in last year. It looks like that number was slightly above 1.7 million tons, so it's headed in the wrong direction. Uh, based on our market research, uh, 226,000 tons of that material uh, are easily compostable, which means that it doesn't take uh, a whole lot of special effort for us to acquire uh, that material and get it to our compost process. Uh, if we were uh, less ambitious, let's say uh, we only got 25% of that material away uh, from the landfill, that's you know just short of 60,000 tons. Uh, the savings in reduction of tipping fees and infrastructure for just the city of Memphis would be a little, um, just short of one and a half million dollars annually. Uh, and atmospheric carbon would be reduced by 215 million pounds. Uh, uh, we are blessed with an awful lot of land that we don't manage super well over in this part of the state. Uh, so we don't have the same uh, pressing issues with landfill space as say Middle Tennessee does. Uh, but eventually all finite resources will be exhausted. So that's something that we need to be looking for in the future. Uh, but it does significantly extend the landfill life uh, and reduce the volume and potency of leachate, which, as uh, I mentioned earlier, is expensive uh, to uh, control and treat, uh, and often that burden falls on the taxpayer. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the benefits of a multi-stream approach. And by multi-stream, I mean we need to be catching organics waste uh, at every point in the economy that creates it. Uh, so we're talking about agricultural, industrial, commercial, residential, uh, everywhere that we can get a hold of this and divert it from the landfill is a win for all of us. The big deal for the multi-stream approach, if, if you have the capacity to receive it, is you hit that, uh, I know Robert talked about that meter cube of critical mass for thermophilic compost. Uh, there's also a critical mass uh, for capacity, the more buy-in we have, the more material uh, a composter is able to receive, uh, the more capacity we can put on the collection of those materials. It's kind of a feedback loop because we, unlike landfills, create a saleable finished product um, and we operate on a small footprint. So we can essentially, we can essentially uh, sell the same airspace uh, every 70 days uh, at our facilities, whereas the landfill kind of sells it once, compacts it to get the, the most bang for their buck, and then it's kind of there forever. Um, the, more comp the more food waste we can take in, the more compost we can sell, the more revenue we can generate, the more opportunities for diversion uh, we can create, lather, rinse, and repeat. Uh, we create food waste in all of those sectors. Uh, so the more opportunities we can engage in, the, the, the stronger and larger our operations can become. Um, and you can scale. And we'll talk a little bit more about scaling here in just a second. Uh, diversity of feedstocks also increases the quality of finished products. If all of our all of our material were coming, say, from an egg farm, and all we had uh, were egg shells and egg residue uh, and wood chips to create, uh, you, run, you wind up with a incredibly calcium rich alkaline uh, compost material. Uh, the benefits of a residential program is uh, the diversity of food scraps and materials that you can collect uh, at those single point sources. 
ensuring that the material is diverse and creating a uh, much more well-rounded and balanced finished product. Uh, and in Memphis, we're engaged in a food waste uh, operation uh, right now that is being headed by our partners at Clean Memphis uh, and supported by the NRDC. And the NRDC data from last year indicate that that uh, 40 percent of the food waste generated in our municipality over here in in lovely Memphis, Tennessee, uh, is uh, of residential providence. So 40% of food wasted in Memphis comes from home. Uh, very important to consider when you're developing a municipal program. Uh, this guy is spraying er uh, all kinds of good erosion stuff. Uh, sometimes we think about uh, finished products in the compost industry uh, as, you know, basically a, a soil conditioner amendment slash fertilizer for uh, landscaping and agricultural applications. Turns out uh, that there is a huge diversity of finished products, including filters for VOCs uh, and erosion blankets, uh, construction materials, all kinds of things. Uh, and it can be uh, it can be very helpful to integrate into the economic development plan for the region, uh, and it's a great lever for growth. Our, our, the perception of organics recycling and composting is that it's a very progressive endeavor and tends to attract uh, young folk, young professional folks that are looking to live uh, in a culture that includes progressive thinking. Uh, so there's definitely a, an economic forcing. Uh, for composting as well. And it creates an opportunity for the pairing of producers and end users. Uh, we can help uh, companies, corporations with uh, zero waste to landfill mandates to achieve their goals. Uh, we can often provide a cheaper alternative than the landfill to uh, tree companies and food, wa uh, food aggregators uh, for their waste products. Uh, and we can also tr attract uh, uh, industry that is looking to create value-added uh, materials uh, out of our uh, finished product as well. Pretty neat, lots of opportunities. Uh, and the savings is often passed down uh, to the taxpayer and, and because uh, Republic and our friends at Rubicon and Waste Management aren't taking our stuff to landfill out of the goodness of their hearts, they're uh, they're uh, they're charging us to haul that stuff, uh, and they're charging us to receive that stuff on the tipping side of things. Tipping fees is how much by ton or by yard it costs, uh, or by truckload, I guess, to tip that material to to dump that material at the landfill. Uh, cheaper materials for the municipality if the relationship is public and private in, in terms of partnership, uh, which also cuts down on spending in the government uh, and frees up capital uh, to fund other programs like maybe education so we can buy kids some books uh, or fix a couple of potholes here and there every once in a while. I know everybody would be excited to see more of that. Um, just a few of the challenges and obstacles that I personally have experienced and, and I think if you ask my colleagues uh, that run uh, composting operations in, in, in Tennessee and elsewhere, they would probably agree uh, with a lot of these statements. Uh, here in Tennessee, the, uh, I grew up in New England and uh, composting was always a thing where I grew up. Recycling was a thing since I was a little boy. Uh, but here in West Tennessee, the, there's a low cultural value of services and finishes, finished products uh, associated to composting. Uh, composting as organics recycling because, you know, when it comes down to the brass tacks, we're recycling food waste and yard waste. Uh, it's actually super efficient uh, recycling. Uh, as you all know, uh, internationally, only 9% of all the plastic that we have ever created in the history of mankind has been recycled one time, uh, and all of it is still with us in one way, shape, or form 
uh, in the environment. And I'm afraid that's our burden to bear for generations to come. Uh, composters, uh, less any contamination in that waste stream, are recycling 100% of that material and putting it back out into the world in a very meaningful and useful way, solving other problems at the same time. So the importance and value of composting and organics as a recycling agent uh, are not where they should be uh, vis-a-vis uh, their intrinsic value at this point, uh, and that's a big deal. Uh, cost to scale, uh, you know, being a bucket slinger uh, from the get-go, you can, you know, get a, a pick em up truck and a trailer and a bunch of buckets together uh, and, uh, and, you know, old uh, industrial um, properties are pretty easy to come by in this part of the world. Um, but it comes a certain point when you start heavy hauling, you know, Tanner, 10 or 12,000 pounds of food waste at a time where the old Dodge pick em up truck isn't going to cut it anymore. And you got to invest in box trucks and one arm bandits uh, and, uh, you know, heavy equipment at the compost facility and big screeners and grinders and all the, all the fun toys that we little boys like and little girls like to play with when we were little uh, in the front yard in the sandbox. Um, so that there is a there is a capital component as you scale that can be a, a significant obstacle. And I grew up in a working class family, the son of an electrician, and I never did perfect the uh, art of asking anybody for money for things I hadn't done for them yet. Uh, so that that precipitates a bit of a struggle when you're trying to trying to do that big scale situation, um, you know, uh, expressly through sweat equity. Uh, geographic restrictions. Um, composting is intrinsically a local business because food waste and compost are heavy. We have a hauling radius, but it's, I mean, it would not be feasible for me to haul a load of compost uh, from Memphis, uh, say, to Chattanooga, where we're looking at permitting another site right now. So having uh, another site in Chattanooga that's, that's capturing that food waste and serving that market locally uh, is the way to do it. It's just not feasible to move uh, the feedstocks uh, super long distances, even in, in heavy haulers and dry vans and uh, sludge boxes and stuff like that. And the finished product is, uh, you know, anywhere from 1,250 to 1,400 pounds per cubic yard. So that's, uh, that gets pretty heavy pretty fast as well. Uh, so we, you know, had to say no to opportunities uh, that were not geographically centric to our operation. That would have been very exciting, uh, but we just could not make that uh, cost efficient for our potential partners. Um, so that's a, that is a big obstacle for sure, geographic limitations. Uh, I do want to say one more thing about recycling. So Memphis has had a big hiccup, we'll say, recently in recycling programming where curbside has been paused or indefinitely in some uh, cases. I want everybody on this call to keep in mind that we can stop consuming plastic. Uh, we, need, we may not be able to stop cold turkey and entirely consuming plastic, uh, but we can look into durable items, we can re reduce and refuse where they're not necessary, and we can replace those with bioplastics that are made from cornstarch or potatoes or sugar cane or beet sugar uh, or other renewable materials. Um, that break down in an industrial compost like the uh, operation, like the one that I run here in Memphis. Uh, we cannot stop consuming food. If we stop consuming food, uh, we will die. Uh, that's a very simple equation uh, and hard to argue with. Uh, we can improve the quality of the nutrition and the calories that we're intaking, but those that caloric intake will remain the same. So this problem with organics recycling is not going away anytime soon, and we need to address it. ASAP. Um, so there are other options real quickly uh, in managing organic waste streams. There's a lot about gasifiers and anaerobic digesters. There was a big article in BioCycle recently uh, about a gigantic anaerobic digester uh, in New Jersey. Uh, fantastic. Better than the landfill. All Anything really and truly is better than throwing all our stuff in a big hole in the ground and trying to forget about it because it's going to come back to visit us whether we like that or not. 
Um, composting is an opportunity to solve problems in other sectors uh, as well. Uh, if you look at that second bullet point, 80% of the historic topsoil uh, in some areas of the world has been lost in the last 50 years. And that right there speaks specifically to Iowa. That was the case study that I'm referencing. There should probably be a citation there. Uh, but America's breadbasket, known for its bounty and its endless production, is struggling right now. There are some counties in uh, western Iowa uh, that are out of topsoil. Uh, and that's that's not a story that's unique to Iowa, that, that folks are planting uh, directly into the subsoil and completely dependent on synthetic chemicals and poisons of, of all uh, uh, shapes and sizes to support their harvest every year. Uh, and you think about where 80% of all that topsoil, billions and billions of tons of, of carbon has gone. It's either down in the bottom of the Mississippi River headed out to uh, the Gulf of Mexico to cause uh, anoxic dead zones and negatively impact our fishing industry, uh, or it's been volatilized and converted to atmospheric carbon, and we know what carbon in the atmosphere is doing right now. You can ask any polar bear. Um, and it's a great opportunity for us to, to provide the raw materials necessary for our farming partners uh, to own their fertility uh, and reduce their dependence on synthetic inputs, create a uh, higher density finished uh, nutritional finished uh, product, uh, produce uh, and pass on that uh, savings in, to the consumer while improving public health. It's just a, stacking an awful lot of wins uh, if you look at it from that perspective, uh, really and truly. Uh, and we have to fix food. Uh, I don't know if anybody's watched Kiss the Ground, but the data that they express in that documentary is accurate. And based on all the big smarties around the world working in ag science, we've got about 60 harvests left under the status quo right now. 60 years worth of agriculture left given our land use out of a 15,000 year agricultural tradition, uh, if that helps to put it in context. So we got to do something about it now, because if we fix food, uh, we can look at fixing just about everything else. So uh, Daisy wants to say thank you, uh, and you can hit the compost ferry up uh, for more information on why composting is important and how you can connect with composters uh, over in our part of the world uh, on uh, this email and this URL right here. And this is this is Daisy May, my my best friend and the official mascot of the compost ferry. Uh, and that's pretty much what I have to say right now. I'm going to swing past this slide here in just a second and give you some references, but I'll leave this up for a minute so folks can grab that. Ashley, do we have any questions that we want to run through real quick? We do. We have a couple questions, and thank you. I uh, always enjoy hearing you speak. Uh, I can always count on you being honest <laughs> with how things are going, so thank you for that. Um, but yes, we do have a couple of questions. So uh, first one, would you encourage food waste producers such as grocery stores, cafeterias, uh, et cetera, as first customers for large-scale food waste diversion to avoid um, potential, sorry, I'm scrolling, <laughs> um, potential contamination, which can often be seen in individual residential collection operations like recycling? That's a that's a uh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I I I'm privy to some uh, contamination statistics for the curbside recycling program here in Memphis. Uh, I'm not sure if those are public. So out of respect to my friends and partners uh, in the division of solid waste here locally, I'm going to just say that it's a lot, uh, and it makes the the function of that program pretty untenable. Um, we've been very intentional in my particular experience uh, in educating folks about what is compostable and what is not, uh, and relying very heavily on graphics uh, to communicate that, because people remember pictures, they don't, they'll kind of blank out when you get past like a 120 character tweet range 
uh, uh, text communication. Uh, so we've just, you know, green is go, red is no, and it has resulted in a very low uh, contamination ratio for us in this market. Significantly lower than the average for the for the country. I, I I'm proud to say actually. Um, with the big producers, we we do engage on industrial and commercial contracts. We have a uh, contamination uh, fee for folks that are non-compliant because again we're very 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 intentional about our training on the front end and our onboarding with our partners because their success. Uh, is our success, and honestly, our success is contingent on their being successful partners uh, in supplying us a clean feedstock. Uh, when it's not, there's a, a warning uh, system where it's like three strikes, and then it starts to get more expensive for them, so that it's financially incentivized, uh, and typically that solves uh, solves the problem uh, with the larger scale uh, engagements as well, because uh, nobody likes to throw money at stuff. Uh, and if it's you know cheaper to keep the the plastic bags out of the composting that's uh, compost compostables that are headed our way, uh, usually the folks that are that have P and L on that budget are making financial decisions uh, <laughs> tend to incentivize their direct reports to comply with our very reasonable uh, contamination program and protocol. Uh, but it does it definitely takes a little bit of uh, planning on the front end to uh, minimize that opportunity before it happens, and a little bit of uh, gentle but firm uh, follow-up and consistency and enforcement, uh, for sure. And doesn't it, it, I mean I, we're talking in the neighborhood of one and a half percent of our total feedstock being any kind of contamination at all. Uh, whereas, you know, some recycling programs on the municipal side are, are looking at 40 and 50 percent contamination, which is like, holy cow, how do you run a business like that? Uh, and that's kind of rhetorical because the answer is you don't. It just doesn't, it won't last. Great question. Yeah, and, and great answer. Yeah, um, that, so that's really, I would say, really good percentage of of how much you know, contamination you all have. But if um, I'm using your service and I get charged for putting, you know, things in there it's not supposed to go in there, I'm going to stop doing that and save myself some money. So um, that's a smart idea to do that. For sure, for sure. We we um, we have never had to essay a, a fine on anybody for contamination. Usually a couple of communications fixes it and the looming threat of uh, – Financial uh, repercussion tends to solve that problem. I hope that's helpful for anybody else that's that's looking at at uh, commercial operations. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. You got it. So our uh, last but not least uh, presenter is uh, Brad Van Bauer. He is the Campus Sustainability Officer at University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and has worked in sustainability in higher ed since 2014. Brad earned his master's degree in biology from the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh as well um, as studying Afri African savanna elephants as seed dispersers. In addition to leading the sustainability efforts at University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, Brad has served as lecturer of biology at the university and leads study abroad trips to East Africa and is well connected to the campus biogas program. So, without further ado, Brad, you have presenter capabilities. All right, thanks, Ashley. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great. All right, so um, yeah, my name is Brad. I'm the Campus Sustainability Officer for the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. Um, Brian Langhoff, who's actually the Biogas Program um, Director, was not able to attend today, so he asked me to step in. Um, he is much more, uh, you know, in touch as he kind of manages the, the biogas operations on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but both of our contact information 
um, is up for folks if, if you have questions for either of us. <clears throat> um, so the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh has a really long history of um, sustainability and we're trying to lead sustainability initiatives. Um, we are, uh, recently we had um, two campuses merge with our campus, so the UW-Fox Valley campus and the uw Lac campus, um, which are both about 20 minutes north or south of us, um, recently merged with our campus a few years ago. And so among all of our campuses, we're about um, 10,000 students is our total campus population. Um, and like I said, you know, we've really been striving for, um, you know, just setting some high goals in terms of energy, um, you know, using renewable resources and really being leaders in sustainability. Um, for example, in 2015, Sierra um, Club Magazine's mm -hmm. Cool Schools list listed us as the third greenest school in the country. Um, you know, we have everything on campus from lead gold buildings, um, several lead silver buildings, solar thermal, um, solar electric panels, green roofs. Um, we've really done a lot on our kind of campus buildings and operations side um, to just become more sustainable. And that really started, you know, probably at least 20, you know, close to 20 years ago. So um, we've been kind of making this slow march um, towards just becoming a more sustainable institution. Um, and really, you know, kind of a, a highlight point for us in that is our biogas systems. And so we have two um, biogas systems right now. One is our sort of on-campus city um, dry fermentation operation. Um, and then the other is a small farm um, operation, about a 250 head cow. Um, dairy is just kind of sort of outside of, of Oshkosh. Um, and so that's a wet digestion or wet uh, facility there. Um, I also want to mention, um, you know, that these biogas facilities are very much tied to the education, kind of the central mission of the university. Um, sustainability is a core part of, um, you know, the teaching, research, learning, all of those components for the university. Um, it is one of the kind of central themes of our general education. So every student at the university goes through a sustainability course. Um, oftentimes they will take tours of these biogas facilities and learn about how they operate and that sort of thing. Um, we also get a lot more sort of in-depth and hands-on um, learning experiences for these students, probably about 50 students per year intern, um, either in our Environmental Research and Innovation Center, which is the lab that does all of the testing, um, you know, to kind of make, make sure quality control is happening at our biogas facilities. Um, as well as students in the engineering tech program, through the sustainability office, through the biogas program um, in particular. So students really get a lot of good hands-on learning experience, um, you know, going, going through and, and working directly with these biogas facilities, which is really great. So, um, you know, kind of the basics so, uh, behind a, a biogas system, essentially what you're doing is you are taking organic material, this can be animal waste, food waste, ag waste, um, loading it into a digestion tank. Um, so that can either be a sort of wet or dry um, scenario. Um, that material breaks down over a period of time and produces biogas. That biogas can be used to create electricity, heat, um, in some cases vehicle fuel. Um, and what's really important to know is that oftentimes the heat that's generated um, can kind of help keep that digestion tank um, at the temperature that you want it to be at, whether it's a mesophilic or thermophilic, um, you can keep those, those microorganisms in the desired temperature range. Um, and then the, the product that comes out is often called digestate. Um, and so this is where you get the material that's essentially kind of left over after the breakdown process. Um, that can be used for a bunch of, a bunch of different, uh, you know, kind of secondary uses. Um, so a bit more about that. Again, you can see, you know, manure, um, wastewater, food waste, other organics all go into this process. And the, the two things that you're really getting out are biogas and digestate. Again, your biogas can be used for heat, electricity, um, compressed natural gas, and that could also be gas that can be, you know, put into a, a natural gas pipeline system. The digestate um, can be further composted, used for fertilizer, um, animal bedding, or, um, you know, there's certainly uh, research and development to, to 
use that material for other types of products. Um, if we look at just kind of the general U.S. biogas market, um, currently, um, you know, you can see some, some facts and figures here about um, biogas facilities or production sites, right, on farms, wastewater treatment plants, uh, food scrap facilities, and at landfills. Um, but there's also a lot of potential to develop this technology. And so, um, as you probably heard, you know, from uh, Mike's presentation, right, uh, we need, there's a lot of food that is being wasted. Um, and we need to be able to capture that material, um, kind of harness all of the embodied energy that exists in that, in that material. Um, and so there's, there's a great potential for, to develop more biogas facilities um, across the United States. Um, so we'll talk a little bit first about our urban drive facility. Um, so we opened this facility in 2011. When it opened, it was the first industrial scale dry fermentation biodigester in all of the Western Hemisphere. Um, so this facility um, processes about 10,000 tons per year. Um, and we get, uh, you know, all different kinds of food waste. We use campus um, organic waste, so like yard trimmings and those kinds of things. Um, we have a partnership with the city, so the city's uh, yard waste, grass, clippings, and leaves, and those kinds of things end up at our at this site. Um, <clears throat> and we are also connected to the wastewater treatment plant. So the wastewater treatment plant is actually just sort of directly adjacent to this facility. Um, and when we were putting up, up this site and kind of choosing the site, we, you know, it made sense to connect um, these two facilities so that the excess natural gas that they were, or the gases that they were producing could be burned through our combined heat and power unit. So a bit more just kind of about how the, the basic components of this work. Essentially, um, there are four chambers inside um, this BD-1 facility. Um, so these are sealed, we pump out all of the oxygen um, they are loaded up with all of this organic material, and then they run for 28 days. Um, generally, we keep them, you know, we want to get them up to about 100, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, that's generally the, the temperature where, where these microorganisms are happiest. Um, and then over that 28-day period, they produce gas. That gas goes into a large um, storage bladder, which is kind of in the top part of the building. Um, and then that gas gets pulled off and run through our generator or combined heat and power unit. So a little bit more detail here. Um, the material is also sprayed with um, uh, kind of a liquid from our percolate tank. And so the percolate is essentially cow manure um, with a little bit of liquid added um, and so that we can pump it through this kind of circulating system. So all the material is loaded in, it is sprayed it runs through that process, and then we just kind of let um, those microorganisms do their job, break everything down, um, and produce that, that nice biogas for us that we get to then burn. Um, and that creates um, uh, heat and electricity for us. And so uh, the facility uh, operates really efficiently. It probably only uses about 5% um, of the energy that it creates. So 95% of the energy production, you know, is able to go out for um, for other use. And so our uh, electricity um, is purchased by our utility. <clears throat> so we have a power purchase agreement with our utility. They buy the electricity from us. We get a credit on our bill for the entire university. Um, the heat uh, helps heat the facility itself. Um, and we're currently looking at a project to connect the heat production from our combined heat and power unit to um, another campus building that is also directly adjacent to the biodigester. So our campus facilities building is right next door, um, and we're looking at a project to basically utilize the heat um, <clears throat> from this facility to heat that building. And that should offset about 75% of the heat um, consumption that's currently used right now through just kind of heating from natural gas through the, through the utility. Um, at the end of the 28-day cycle, what we get out is that digestate, and so um, we have a partnership with a local um, company that does like landscaping and that sort of thing, and they are certified to do 
uh, composting in the state of Wisconsin, and so they are our compost site. So the, tier, the material comes out um, at the end of the 28 days, and basically the way it works is we take half of the material out and leave half in, um, and that's so, again, there's that kind of inoculating uh, process that allows some of the uh, microorganisms to remain behind and jumpstart the next batch. So 50% fresh material is added, we close the doors and start that 28-day cycle all over. Um, what's great is we have four bays, so there's four of these tanks or units, um, and they can run um, on the 28-day cycle, and we basically are opening one a week. So there's always three sort of running while we're switching one out. Um, just looking at feedstock, so again, I mentioned we process about 10,000 tons per year. On average, we're getting about 200 tons per week. Um, we're generally about 55% food waste, 37% um, yard waste, and then straw. Um, so we do, you know, get farmers that will bring in kind of their um, spent bedding and that sort of thing. Um, we've had contracts with canning companies to kind of bring whatever doesn't end up in the can, you know, sort of ends up to... Uh, ends up at our facility. Um, again, I mentioned we have a partnership with the city so that a lot of the yard waste that folks bring from their individual yards ends up here. Um, uh, almost all of the pre-consumer um, campus food waste ends up uh, in this, in the, at this facility as well as uh, some of our post-consumer food waste. So this gives you a little bit of idea of kind of the holding area where all of the material um, is stored and kind of you can get a different look at um, kind of those greens and browns um, that Robert was talking about earlier on. So these are all different types of materials. Um, some really good benefits, uh, you know, for anaerobic digestion just beyond, beyond producing electricity. Um, so again, I talked about using that thermal value. We can use that heat. Um, for this, uh, it's nutrient management. This is an entirely closed system, so we don't really have to worry um, about, you know, sort of that percolate leaking out and getting into a waterway, you know, the nearby river or stream. Um, so there's a lot of reuse. This is all of, you know, very much closed system. Um, the system also has a um, biofilter for odor reduction, so we have microorganisms um, that basically are, there's these filters that are, uh, the air that's kind of circulated through um, gets passed over those, um, and the microorganisms break down some of those odor-causing um, chemicals, and that helps keep odor, odor down near the, near the facility. Um, <clears throat> obviously, production of value-added products, we can, you know, we can produce compost um, at the end of this um, you know, at the end of the system here, and that's a that's a product that we can then we can then sell and um, kind of improve sort of our return on investment there. Certainly, uh, we're starting to look at more things like renewable natural gas, um, so producing fuels, you know, through this process. Um, you know, there, there's many many benefits just beyond the the production of electricity uh, through these anaerobic digestion facilities. Um, so the types of containers that we use, um, you know, you can see the, the different bins here. We uh, used to have our, our food waste hauler was Sanamax, um, and they had notified us uh, not too long ago that they were basically stopping doing um, food waste hauling, uh, and I think that was partially due to kind of changes that had happened in light of COVID response. Um, and so we had to kind of figure out a way to move some of this collection process internally. Um, and so luckily we were kind of already in the process of doing that anyway. Um, and so our student green fund, um, which is a fund of money, it's about $60,000 every year that the students um, have, you know, sort of voted and opted to pay into, pays for sustainability projects. Um, and one of the projects they funded a couple of years ago, and we recently, you know, finally just got to come to fruition here was this campus organics collection program. Um, and so it allowed us to purchase this truck um, and lift system. Um, and Sanamax actually gave us uh, a lot of the bins um, at, at very little cost. Um, and so we were able to internalize a lot of our 
um, organics collection program into campus so that we don't have to pay a vendor to do this. Um, we can manage things better like contamination and frequency of pickups, that sort of thing. Um, it really allowed us um, some, some good flexibility to bring that, that program into the university itself. Um, and so the biogas program manages all of that. We're also able to expand out to other areas. So one example is like our biology department. Um, we have a huge greenhouse where we, you know, keep a lot of plants. When those things need to get switched out, um, we have a, we've offered up a bin to them so that we can pick up those kinds of things from other areas outside of just, you know, general food production um, cafeterias and things at the university. Um, so like I mentioned, um, our compost, uh, so the digestate comes out and our, the company that we partner with, Vilgus Landscaping, um, they pick up the material and then they create the windrows. Um, for the kind of finishing aerobic side of uh, curing and letting that compost sit um, through the you know, kind of through the rest of its life um, before it's ready for sale. Like I mentioned, we are um, starting to look into things like renewable natural gas production at our uh, at our biogas facilities. Um, so this is just kind of one area, sort of as future directions that we think about. Um, you know, expanding the kinds of things that um, that these facilities can offer us. We do have a couple of CNG vehicles um, in our fleet, and so it would be really great if we were basically to able to close the loop again um, and provide the fuel for those vehicles um, right on site on campus made with the food waste that the students are producing from the dining facilities. Went through that kind of fast, but just want to uh, see if folks have any questions for me. And there are a couple questions. Um, so um, one of them, or I guess two of them kind of relate, but are digesters financially sustainable and what regulations or economics encourages it? Probably a sure. large question there. <laughs> Yeah, um, so in terms of, you know, are they financially sustainable? Um, when we first launched this, when we first launched this project, um, we expected about a seven year ROI. Um, I think it came out to a little bit closer to 10 years. Um, but again, you know, there are certainly ways, you know, if you can diversify um, the benefits uh, you know, the project is going to pay for itself a lot more quickly. So, um, like I said, we're looking at now connecting the, the building next door to provide the heat. And so if this building um, is saving us probably somewhere in the ballpark of like $20,000 a year in heating costs, um, right, that's going to help kind of drive up your, um, reduce your ROI, right, and, and make your return on investment a lot quicker. Um, so I think for folks who are considering putting up facilities like this, um, it's really important to think about where the facility goes. You know, can you tie into a um, wastewater treatment plant, right, and benefit from any excess gas that they are using? Making sure that your um, combined heat and power unit kind of fits the production um, that you're going to be able to achieve so that you don't have to flare any excess gas. If you're constantly um, creating so much gas that you have to flare a lot of it, um, that's essentially just, you know, energy that you could be funneling into greater electricity or heat production. Great. Thanks uh, for that. And there is one more question. Um, are you getting a tip fee for the feedstocks? Yes. Yep. So we do charge shipping fees um, to the folks who bring anything into the digester facility. Um, the other thing that's great right now, because we've moved our hauling operation internally, um, is we're starting to reach out to more local businesses, you know, folks that are kind of on a smaller scale, um, to get materials from them. Um, because, you know, the, the service that Sandamax used to one, once provide to us, we've been kind of now, we can kind of fill that niche in the market, right? We can go to um, the local grocery store chains. Um, local restaurants, et cetera, and we can be their, their food waste pickup and help generate more renewable energy. Um, so we're trying to work out right now the different kinds of tip fees um, for different uh, levels of, of customers and size of customer and that sort of thing. Um, 
but yeah, we, we definitely do do charge a fee based on, you know, kind of, there's a, there's a bunch of different ways that it gets, uh, gets calculated. Great. Um, there's a comment that your presentation is great, so I wanted to throw that out there, but I don't, see any, other, <laughs> I don't see any other questions. Um, I want to thank everyone. Uh, well, Brad, thank you so much. And I want to thank, thank everyone you. for uh, participating today. And um, I just want to remind everyone that we do have one more webinar in our webinar series that will be on um, March 11th. And we're going to be discussing uh, food waste policy as well as different, different technology solutions. And also we'll be discussing where we can go from here, next action steps, and things that we are doing at TDEC to combat food waste. If anyone has any uh, additional questions or comments um, about uh, this webinar, or if you've been a part of uh, any of the other webinars that we've done, of uh, parts one and two, uh, you can contact me by phone or email. I'm fine with either. And I'm happy to uh, get you connected with any of the speakers or to answer any questions that you may have. But if there are no other questions or comments, I want to thank you so much again. And just to let everyone know that there will be a follow-up email sent out in the next week with the slides and the recording if you would like to go back and watch, especially if you want to start your own uh, backyard composting. It would be great to go back and listen to uh, Robert's expertise on that, as well as Mike's expertise on uh, commercial and residential compo uh, compost operations, and also Brad with uh, what they're doing at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. So thank you all so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your week.
email. <laughs> Sorry, I was waiting on last few people to get off, and I actually found out that I can just kick them off. So, um, <laughs> that's what I did. Um, and it looks like I lost Mike in the process, so my bad on that. Um, thank you all again so much. Um, and Brad, um, Mike did have like a kind of a, a question, but that was more like broad, uh, more like discussion type. So I'm going to get y'all um, connected. Um, maybe y'all can set up a phone call. Um, he just wanted, I guess, wanted to learn more about y'all's experience. And maybe you could connect Brian on that phone call as well with him. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. But um, thank y'all so much. Um, that was really great. And I learned a lot on the food waste diversion part of the hierarchy is, is one that I struggle with more understanding and so it's really great to learn more because it's um I I can help people more through my program. So I really appreciate that. Um I hope y'all enjoyed it as well. Um if y'all don't have anything else or any questions then I just I just wanted to thank y'all so much for speaking. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah thanks you. Ashley. Yeah. Um well thank y'all and um I I will be putting, uh, Brad, do you want me to put your contact info in the follow-up emails and everyone, or do you want me to put yours and Brian's? Yeah, you could include both of us. Okay, both of you. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you both so much, and I hope you have a great day. Okay, you too. Bye. Thanks, bye-bye.